Do believe I might be the variety. <laughs> However, I, I'm here to remind you that next week is Mardi Gras Sunday. Mardi Gras is actually on Tuesday. So next Sunday is our silly hat day. And believe me, this is a serious hat for me. Wait till you see this <laughs> silly one. Uh, those of you who are watching on YouTube, uh, do wear your baseball hat while you watch. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Put this up here, just for now. Uh, just a reminder for some parents outreach. Uh, we have two more Sundays to fill this pew back there. It's the uh, 28 days of listening with the two parents. And tomorrow I'm not going to come, so I'll just tell you when you come in. It's going to be mom. But I um, want to speak well about what a worthy congregation can do in the midst of trouble. The truth of the scripture and looking upon the enemy. Um, agencies. This is where our food and our donations go to on money donations. The food bank also supports the snack programs that work within the schools in the city. Um, they
feel I'm able-bodied so I'm going to try and help a little bit more directly but I just wanted to bring forth and remind people of just what our money and money donations and our food is going into so thank you and uh, keep those donations coming in I will count the boxes at the end of the month thank you and I just wanted to kind of piggyback something that Karen said um, in my last year at seminary, which I remember to a great degrees was either fondness or what the heck was that, um, I was lucky enough to be assigned to the Metro Food Bank in Halifax as um, part of my social justice uh, ministry. And, and that's in many ways it was kind of opened my eyes to the whole reality of food banks. And it's been one reason why it's become my hobby horse for my ministry is the food bank, because I was work intimately within the organization and, uh, and saw its importance and that was you know like 20 years ago so anywho uh, let's just take a moment now we have all recently been following the tragic events in turkey and syria over the recent earthquake and the, the growing death toll of the victims and the after effect of all the of the tragedy itself I'd like to share a prayer from the United Church of Canada for that situation and then we'll also talk just a few moments about what can we do. God, in the face of destruction that tears down homes and threatens life, we pray that your deep abiding love be felt by those who are grieving, those who fear for themselves and their communities, those who are struggling and those who are offering aid. May they continue to be strengthened by your spirit. May we extend our hearts in prayer. Amen. The United Church of Canada in these events usually works with a variety of agencies and a variety of organizations who we feel have a better sense of what's going on on the ground. So for anyone who wishes to contribute to the ongoing relief efforts and what happens afterwards, I certainly would invite you to go to the United Church of Canada website and they will show various links of uh, various groups that you can support. Um, other groups I can certainly re recommend are groups like Doctor Without Frontiers. And the whole infrastructure of support and care to show that we're willing to do what we can at our end to bring comfort to these people in this time. So, let's just take a But the gospel doesn't need a coalition devoted to keeping the wrong people out. It needs a family of sinners, saved by grace, committed to tearing down the walls, throwing open the doors and shouting, Welcome, there is bread and wine. Come eat with us and talk. This isn't a kingdom for the worthy. It is a kingdom for the hungry. Our opening hymn is Teach Me God to Wonder, Voices United 299.
kind of a bit of a surprise. Um, I mean, the prayer approach is by uh, John Calvin, and John Calvin is one of the stalwarts of the Reformation. But uh, for those of us who have a warped sense of humor, we like to joke about how dour and all this kind of stuff he was. And, but I was surprised to discover he actually did believe the importance of emotions. That was still a shock to my system of dealing with. Anyway, let's <laughs> O God, in whom is the fullness of light and wisdom, enlighten our minds by your Holy Spirit and give us grace to receive your word with reverence and humility, without which no person can understand your truth. For the sake of Jesus Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all glory. Amen. Our response of prayer today is the prayer of truth to Archbishop Oscar Romero. It helps now and then to step back and take the long view. The kingdom is not only beyond our efforts, it is even beyond our vision. We accomplish in our lifetime only a fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is God's work. Well, nothing we do is complete, which is another way to say that the kingdom will always lie beyond us. No statement says all that could be said. No, no prayer fully expresses our faith. No confession brings perfection. No, no, no absolute brings fullness. No program accomplishes the cut church's mission. No set of goals and objectives includes everything. This is what we are about. We plant the seeds so that one day will grow. We water the seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promises. We lay foundations that will need further develop them. We provide yeast that produces effects far beyond our capabilities. We cannot do everything, and there is a sense of liberation in realizing that. This enables us to do something and to do it well. It may be incomplete, but it is the beginning. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. Yeah. We are workers, not master builders. Ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets, not teachers, not we shall enter into our time of confession of Lord, listen to your children praying, Voices United 400. sinners. I find that comforting. God, in this moment, in this place, we present ourselves to you, to open our hearts, to have faith that you will listen to our prayers, our confession of brokenness, and renew us with grace. God have mercy. God have mercy. Let us give thanks as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For mine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our next hymn is, I think, a suitable lead-in to the time to renew promises and commitments. Our hymn is, I'm going to live so God can use me. Voices United 575. Share in God's word. Blessed are you, O God, for your word of strength, of encouragement, of hope. That contagious word which allows us to believe and to move towards the renewal of our world. Grant us to hear your word and to preserve perseverance, putting it into practice. Amen. Our responsive reading is Psalm 119, verses 1 to 8. Happy are those whose way is blameless, those who walk in the law of God. Happy are those who keep God's decrees, who seek God with their whole heart. 
who also do no wrong but walk in God's ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways be steadfast in keeping your statutes, God. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your I will praise you with an upright heart when I, when I learn your righteous ordinances. I will observe your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 to 9. And so, brothers and sisters, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but rather as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you not, were not ready for solid food. Even now, you are still not ready. 
for you are still of the flesh. For as long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving according to human inclinations? For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not, are you not merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose, and each will receive wages according to the labor of each. For we are God's servants working together. You are God's field, God's building. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <coughs> Trains running by. <laughs> Wonder if there'll be people in it one day. <laughs> Ghost train of Bonnie Doon. That sounds like quite a good old Scottish folk story. <laughs> the Ghost train of Bonnie Doon. <laughs> the bagpipes kick in and I'll start working on it tonight. YouTube video will be out next week. Thank you. In his letter to the Corinthians, Paul is trying, well, uh, I don't know that I'd actually use the word guide. I think he's responding. The thing is, as I've said before, and I'll say again about Paul, is he's reacting uh, in the Corinthians. A problem has arisen. He writes this letter to try and not just solve the immediate problem, but to put the whole thing into context. Because Paul is aware of the tensions that exist within the new community as they try to negotiate new relationships with God and with one another. The reality is this is a timeless issue for Christianity. We're still doing it. Um, we're still negotiating what does it mean to follow the way of Christ Jesus as we live our lives in the world today? How does our faith guide how we respond to the various crises in the world? You know, the example I gave earlier about this uh, ad campaign in the Super Bowl. The, the message itself is pretty, you know, is great. You know, Christians should be helping refugees. Jesus was a refugee. Most of the stories of the Bible are about people who are refugees. You know, so surely your faith would head to the other direction. But often Christians go in different directions. We are shaped by our own desires, our own experiences. My experiences are a Christian are very different from other people's experience of a Christian. And so we're constantly negotiating. How much does our faith work in the world around us? What can we say about our faith that will allow us to be faithful to what Jesus wants us to be, but maybe at the same time antagonize others? What happens when we say that we support the right of refugees to live in this country because of our faith in Jesus Christ? And people say, but there's too many of them. You know, how do we, you know, what happens if it's your neighbor, your friend, or whatever? This is an ongoing process of negotiation, of awareness. How far do you push? When do you step back? And Paul's letters are the ground zero of that. Because Paul is working with a community that is struggling with the human reality of distractions that Paul is convinced are holding the people back from fully immersing themselves in the faith. Yeah, but at the same time, it's fair to say that there are moments when I want to say to Paul, give these people a break. Give them a chance to breathe. They're trying their best. They're trying their best to be faithful in the midst of a world that is filled with so many distractions. And for them in particular, the change is sudden. They're part of a radical break with all that is familiar to them. And so sometimes I think they just need to take a moment. 
And I would also have to suggest to Paul that he needs to get over himself. Not everyone has had his personal encounter with the risen Christ to bring him into the faith. Most of us have had to rely upon our own experiences and the people around us, growing up in the church, becoming part of the church as an adult, day-to-day -day humdrum existence of life in the faith. That's what shaped us who we are. I love Paul. I love his witness, his passion, his desires. But I do believe that there are moments when I can see Jesus behind him, rubbing the bridge of his nose, muttering, geez, Paul, you might be right, but they're not helping. And this is what's maddening about Paul. He usually is right. But the moments he forgets the importance of being patient. Patient for those who struggle to understand his vision. And this is in full display here in the letter to the Corinthians in this part. I fed you with milk because you were not ready for solid food. Oh gee, thanks. I didn't realize I was that miserable. You're not ready for the good news because you're merely people of the flesh. Well, what else would we be? Yes. You are a community driven by jealousies and uh, quality. I mean, this is really rich coming from Paul. Of all people accusing other people of being immersed in jealousy and quality, this guy takes a fight at the drop of a hat. And he's saying to the Corinthians, oh, you're not ready for the good news. Well, I can imagine Jesus saying, well, what about that fight you had with Cephas? They are not a community that fully embraces the way of Jesus Christ. Well, of course they're not. They've just started. It takes time. And we're still a work in progress. 1900 years later, I don't think we're that much better. We're still dealing with the same variety of issues, of divisions, who's important, who's not, the whole magilla of, you know, who do, we, who do we bring in? Who do we kick out? All this kind of stuff that we as a Christian community, the Christian institution, have been fighting with for 19, 2,000 years now. As I said, Paul doesn't help matters. And, but then he switches gears. He's still cranky. But remembers he's part of a team of people who are trying their best. And then he starts once more in that common theme in the letter of Corinthians that the only way for the body of Christ to flourish is a community. Religion, Christianity, it's a communal event. And then, to be honest, that's why I don't really have much patience for people who tell me that they're Christian and spiritual but they don't come to church. Well, you know what? They're kind of missing the point. The point of Christianity is you're part of a community. And one of the strengths and weaknesses of that is living in a community. You support one another and there are times when you drive each other almost to distraction. And that's part of faith, learning to live within that reality. We are not perfect and we will never be perfect. And I thank the living God every day we will not be perfect because I don't like perfection. I like the whole mess that we're in. And there are times when it drives me to distraction. But I'd rather we were all working together, stumbling towards, trying to figure this stuff out and be supportive and caring for one another. Because as Paul says in that, the odd moment of humility that he does somehow get infected by, we are all God's servants working together. Each and every one of us is called by God to serve the vision of the kingdom of God. We are all part of the plan. You're not working for me. And of course in the United Church of Canada that's easy for me to say because we all, I'm the hired hand. But in other churches when they do have those high kind of hierarchies of bishop, archbishops, cardinals, popes and whatever. You don't work for them either. You work for God. 
That is the message that Paul says in the very beginning. He says, you're not working for me, you're not working for Apollos, you're not working for Chloe or other. You are working for God to fulfill God's vision of the kingdom. You are part of the plan because God has faith in your ability to be part of that vision. And Paul develops what Jesus himself had made very clear. The kingdom is not meant to be some vague, fuzzy reward for a well-behaved life, but it's the reality of a community doing what it can to love God and to love one another. And to do so in the here and now. The vision of the kingdom is meaningless if we don't try to live it now. If we be and let's look at it. But this, you know, this is the thing I want to say to Paul. You're already doing something profoundly radical. That in the community of Corinth, in the communities of Galatia, the communities of Thessalonica, and all the other little churches, all these little groups, that Paul helped to create this radical moment of a major to the world. We don't want to live by your vision. We want to live by the vision of Christ. And it begins around the table. Around the table where people with money, people with influence, will break bread in the company of the poor and those who are enslaved. At that table, as far as God is concerned, each and every one of them is equal. Doesn't matter the kind of life they lead, that they have picked to be part of this community to celebrate the love of God for them and for one another and to be radical in that cry of inclusion. Radical then and it's still a radical now. We still live in that world where we create so many divisions. But Paul is saying to these people, you're not... They've got to do more. Like, come on, Paul. They're just starting. Give them a break. Let them learn from their mistakes. Let them learn from their stumbles. Let them learn from when people share their pain that they didn't feel included. Let the conversations begin. It's difficult. It's a challenge. And all of and unfortunately, all too often, the human ability, the human desire is we want someone else to tell us what to do. And this is very much true in religion. People in Corinth wanted Apollos, wanted Paul, wanted Chloe, wanted whoever. They wanted someone to tell them, how do we do this? Because this stuff is hard. And it is hard. When you live in a community that breaks the rules of the world around you, it is hard to stand out. It is hard to say, I'm going to be different. I'm going to say to the person who the world tells me is inferior, I'm going to treat them like an equal because in God's eyes they are. That's difficult. So we look to others for guidance. You know, I always find it interesting, you know, like anyone outside Stratford doesn't know any better, but in here I'm a minister, they automatically assume I'm holier than them. I remember once I was um, staying with a family and I kind of made some joke about, you know, I, I said that their house was more holier than mine, that there was more religious stuff on the walls and this kind of stuff. And they looked at me and said, no, it's not true, you are holier than us. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Paul is responding to a community where some are looking for guidance, some are looking for leadership. And unfortunately, what always happens, and continues to happen, is that there are those who become leaders not because they want to promote the vision of the kingdom of God, but they want to produce, they want to push their own agenda. And so they listen to these people. And I think one of the things about power is uh, the, the one thing you should always make sure you've been keeping mind about power is never give it to anyone who's actually looking for it. You know, 
give power to people who don't want to be in power and will do their best to get let off for a good time. And Paul, he sounds like one of the kind of people, you know, Paul does sound like, you know, I'm in charge, this is what you do, da, 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 da. But then he rejects this idea that the church needs to be led by such self-appointed experts in the faith, but be a community where all voices are respected because all voices are part of the choir that will produce the kingdom of God. As he says, yeah. I helped to build this community. And yeah, a pause for his leadership continues to offer it. But there would be no point if we were not doing God's work. We would be wasting our time if we weren't part of God's plan. As Paul makes very clear the moment when Paul or Apollos or anyone within the institution of the church tries to use their position in the community to push their own agenda, their own prejudices, because it's usually their prejudices that they want them to push, then the kingdom of God within the community will fade. It will no longer be the body of Christ. It will be just merely another group of people doing what they can. Maybe one time they had a dream of being something better, but now they're just going through the motions. What Paul is reminding the Corinthians and us today is that we're part of a vision of God. And yeah, we do struggle. Sometimes we struggle to comprehend what is going on. And sometimes we wonder, well, how can we even be part of such a thing? Why us? I'm not important. I'm not skilled. I'm not talented. Why me, God? Why me? Because you have listened to the voice of God. In whatever way it was spoken to you, to the actions of a person around you, a moment of clarity, a moment of revelation, something you grew up with, something you came to as an adult. You listened to the voice of God that said, you can be something in this world as part of my vision, my hope, my dream. You wanna give it a try? Sometimes, as we heard in the Oscar Romero prayer, we need to take a step back. Take a moment. Try to see the world as God sees it. Not a world of division created through manufactured hatred of others, but a world filled with possibilities of healing and renewal that will be achieved through a willingness to care for one another. To put our pride and ego in check. To listen to the voice of others. Especially those who in the past we have ignored because we didn't think they were important or right or whatever. Those who we in the church have cast out because we didn't think they were appropriate within our walls. Take a moment. Listen. Listen to their cries. Listen to their pain. Listen to their hope that maybe we can listen and hear the voice of God, reminding us that we are part of a community, part of a shared dream of the hope of the kingdom of God that is with us in the future and is with us in the here and now. At this time, uh, in the past of our time of offering, uh, just, uh, I just take this opportunity to thank all those who have been involved in the, in the life of the church, a reminder of the various ways to give to the church through time, talent, and treasure, and there's a donation plate at the back for those folks who are leaving. And 
thanks for the, the scouts and the guides with us today for the, the fellowship they'll be offering after the service. So just a general reminder of the, the reality of the community that uh, I've been uh, talking about is people. People doing what they can, offering what they can to be part of something that's maybe just a little beyond our imagination, a little beyond our glimpses. Let's come before God in prayer. Prayer does not mean simply to pour out one's heart. It means rather to find the way to God and to speak with God, whether the heart is full or empty. God, we give you thanks for all the many blessings that you share with this world, our community, and this congregation. You look into our hearts and see the lights of hope, of dreams, of possibilities. We give thanks for those moments of grace, those moments of inspiration, when you touch our souls and invite us to see the world as something filled with life, with love, and hope, and possibility. And we give thanks for the people in our lives, those living witnesses to your grace, who enter into our lives and open our hearts to your presence. So in silence, God, we bring our prayers of thanksgiving for these people. of so much to offer our prayers of compassion of care we pray with all in this midst of time of tragedy we pray for all of the struggle in the midst of turmoil political economic social religious we pray for all living in times of uncertainty fearful of where the next meal will come from. We live in all who live in fear, wondering what will happen next in this tiring world of ours. God, we pray for all of our victims of crime, especially in the recent tragedy in Quebec. God, we pray, we pray that we will be your water, your seeds in this world, that we will open our hearts, our hands and eyes to see where you invite us to be your presence, to be witnesses to your care, to offer compassion, service and hope, to do what we can to be in your kingdom here on this earth. Let it begin with our prayers. We offer our prayers to you, O God, for all those in our lives who we know who are grieving, who mourn, who struggle. The struggle of the illness of mind, body, and spirit. For those who are alone. For those who yearn for connection. In silence, God, we bring these names to you. Amen. Our closing hymn is One More Step Along the World I Go, Voices United 639.
we share in a vision of good news. The kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God awaits us. The world is waiting for us to share this good news. Amen.